Support for Outdoor Nevada comes from Land Rover Las Vegas and Jaguar Land Rover Reno, proud to help introduce a new generation of adventurers to the diverse experiences that our state has to offer. Information at lrlv.com or jlrreno.com. Nevada, a landscape as diverse as it is epic, where wide open nature and wild adventure call to the curious and the brave alike. So they were first emergency listed in 89 as an endangered species, and then they were moved shortly after that to a threatened status, which is where they're at right now. I'm tracking desert tortoises to help with conservation efforts. It's here for you. I mean, that's, and it's here for you to have your own experience of the art and to maybe make your own art. I get off the beaten path to see some art in the open desert. Red's Ranch is representative of an intersection of history this is Northeastern Nevada, but I feel like I'm in New England. All right, so we just arrived at the Mint 400. You can see the dust and you can hear the noise from a mile away down on the highway. I immerse myself in the spectacle that is the great American off-road race. I'm John Byrne. I have a passion for the outdoors. Today we're in the Valley of Fire. It's a mid and I'm on a mission to show you the one-of-a-kind history, science, nature, and adventure you find when you step outside. This is Outdoor Nevada. Nevada's state reptile, symbols of the Mojave, and threatened, desert tortoises. It's early in the morning and we're out here at the Boulder City Conservation Easement and we're meeting up with some researchers. They're gonna tell us more about what's going on here with the desert tortoise. Hey, Roy. Hi. So this is the spot, huh? This is it. Meet Roy Avril Murray, the desert tortoise recovery coordinator for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Roy's been working with tortoises for 24 years. What are we trying to accomplish? We're just trying to get their numbers and, and, and track them and see how they're doing? Uh, yeah, that's the gist of it. We released a bunch of tortoises here last fall, and now we're going around the loop and seeing how they're doing since we released them and following them over time. Roy and his team follow approximately 300 desert tortoises in an effort to preserve the species and its habitat. Brent has led us right to wow. uh, a tortoise out. Now, my first question is, where's the, oh, I do see the transmitter. So it's, it's a little radio about the size of, a, uh, I don't know, between a, a quarter and a half dollar covered in epoxy. And, and the convenient thing with tortoises is we can glue things directly to their shell and, uh, and the antenna threads along the back. The monitored tortoises have radio transmitters attached to their shells and each has a unique frequency. And are you seeing a healthy tortoise? Is this a good sign, what we're seeing here? Uh, to me, it looks like a, a healthy tortoise. He's obviously very alert, coming to uh, uh, investigate us. Desert tortoises can live up to 80 years or longer, but it's impossible to determine the exact age of an adult. The population has declined by uh, over 20% and just over the last 10 years. So we've been working with uh, Clark County and the Great Basin Institute to increase the population by uh, releasing some more tortoises here and then uh, monitoring them to see how they're uh, responding, how they're surviving, how they're adjusting to the habitat. How do you feel emotionally about seeing this tortoise and it seems like everything's going okay? When you actually see one alert like this, you see that it, it's curious and the more we study them, the more we find out that you know they're really interesting creatures. But we're lucky to see him today because when it gets warm, he's not going to be out walking around, right? He'll be uh, tucked into, into a burrow uh, in just a couple of hours or so as it starts heating up. Desert tortoises spend the majority of their lives in burrows, primarily to escape the heat or to hibernate. And they, they live alone. There's nobody else in there, right? 
there's probably no one else in there. So every once in a while, we do find other tortoises sharing the same burrow. If somebody's out hiking in the desert out here and they find one of these, what do you do? You just you leave it alone. The key thing is to leave it alone. We, we encourage people to, you know, watch, but uh, don't touch, uh, don't pick it up. They have a tendency to release their bladder. They have large bladders. They store a lot of water in there and living in a desert, that's critical to their survival. And if you scare one and pick it up and it voids that bladder, then it can be a death sentence. Next up is Terry Christopher. Terry works as an associate director at the Great Basin Institute. His experience with tortoises also exceeds 20 years. When did the animals first get into trouble on some sort of list, and, and where do they stand today? So they were first emergency listed in 89 as an endangered species, and then they were moved shortly after that to a threatened status, which is where they're at right now. And are the numbers stabilized? Are they going down, up? Where do we stand? You know, in some of these areas here in southern Nevada, they're slowly starting to trend up, and that's one of the reasons for, you know, adding tortoises out here is to try and increase that population. Obviously, you know, having the, the species expand and propagate is important. So what are the mating seasons, and how does that work out here? So mating occurs primarily in the fall, um, and then the females will ovulate in the spring, lay their eggs uh, late spring, early summer, and usually about 60 days or so for those eggs to incubate and those hatchlings will emerge late summer, early fall. Females lay a clutch of three to 12 eggs up to three times per year. Why do we care about the tortoise and its health? Uh, tortoises are important for a lot of other species. Uh, they provide burrows and habitats for other animals. They help in, in dispersing seeds. So it's, it's kind of an indicator species as to how the desert as a whole is doing. And how is the desert as a whole doing in your opinion? Uh, we're definitely facing some issues. Um, you know, drought is, is an ongoing issue here in southern Nevada and the desert southwest as a whole. Those are things that, that complicate um, the lives of tortoises as well. But you said it, nature works synergistically. It all works together. So it's not just the tortoise. We're looking at the health of the whole desert. You bet, definitely. You know, tortoises have the ability of uh, being very patient animals. You know, they can, they can wait for better times. Thanks a lot. It. Good luck to you. Thank you. What I'm reminded of out here today is that nature is not a novelty. It's a synergistic approach. And when one thing works well, it affects other things. And that's why it feels so good to know that there's guys out here monitoring the whole thing. Art, in its various forms, is all around us, although it's not often you find artwork in the middle of the desert. Wow. Wow. The sheer size of this one. And you know what's really amazing about this one? Sometimes art inspires you, but then there's times like this where the making of the art inspires you just as much. Today, we are at the Goldwell Open Air Museum right outside of Rhyolite where art is wide open to the public. Suzanne, awesome. hi. How are hi, you? John. Nice to see you. Welcome to Goldwell. What an interesting place. I mean, this is the kind of place that really makes the desert fascinating, isn't it? It kind of makes it pop, you know? <laughs> it really does. <laughs> it's so different. Meet Suzanne Hackett Morgan. She's the museum's executive director. She's the one keeping Goldwell alive. How did it all happen? How did this whole place get well, like this? It started with a, an artist who uh, his name is Albert Schukowski. He was from uh, Poland originally, Belgium most recently. And he was uh, going to San Francisco to visit his mother. He went through Death Valley and he's like, this is the place. This is the place where I want to realize my sculpture, The Last Supper. The Last Supper was the first major artwork created and installed at the Goldwell Open Air Museum in 1984. The Last Supper is obviously the genesis piece of this museum. It shows uh, the ghostly shrouds of Christ flanked by his 12 disciples at the Last Supper. The emotion that comes out of this feels almost peaceful, desperate, eerie, and scary all at the same time. Sukolsky created the figures by wrapping live models in wet plaster. After the plaster was set, 
The figures were eventually coated with fiberglass. It's something that's approachable for people. They're certainly welcome to climb inside it and walk around it. And notice if you can, through the fiberglass and the paint, Albert's special sculptural touches in the folds of the fabric. Another popular sculpture called Ghost Rider served as a test piece for the Last Supper. So he's been still out here in the desert for a long time, but every day he asks the question, whose bike is this? I mean, is it his? Who does it belong to? Is he coming? Is he going? I think Albert wanted to see with a single figure, how long is it gonna take for the plaster to dry? You know, how, how, how much time can the person sit in the plastic before they pass out? You know, that kind of thing. How many are here? Well, we have a total of nine large oversized sculptures. Um, seven of them were original pieces that were created by the Belgian artists, and we've added a couple since. Additional pieces were added to the museum site by three other artists in the early 1990s. As you'll discover, a lot of the sculptures have their own personality from lighthearted, like the couch, to kind of, let's face it, Ghost Rider's pretty creepy. And I think part of it is because they were made around real human forms and, to some degree, real human suffering in August. The brightly colored couch is one of the most recent additions. The couch actually has a name. It's called Sit Here. And it's got an exclamation point. Um, it was done by Sophie Siegmann, who was an artist in Germany, and she was an artist in residence at the Children's Museum in Las Vegas. And she did it with uh, the children there. They hand did the tiles, and it was well loved there for a long time. So when it was retired from the Children's Museum, it was out on the uh, loading dock. And I used to see it every day, and I kept thinking, you know, that would be a great piece at Goldwell. And it certainly turned into be one of our most popular pieces. Wow. The colors on this thing out here in the desert, they're just spectacular. And I can really see how the back of the couch mirrors the back of that mountain over there. 800 pounds, fully restored. I guess one man's trash is another man's treasure, right? Let me try this thing out here. Oh, yeah. I need a remote. Let me see here. Oh, honey, my favorite show's on, Outdoor Nevada. This is great. Who would you say this place belongs to? Well, number one, it belongs to all Nevadans, because Albert loved Nevada. But it's really for everybody. He wanted it to be experienced by as many people as possible. And, you know, we just ask, don't vandalize the work. You know, we're lucky that that has not been a problem for us, you know, in over 30 years. This isn't a natural history museum type of situation where they got to go through the gift shop. This belongs to everybody. That's right. It's, it's here for you. I mean, that's, and it's here for you to have your own experience of the art and to maybe make your own art as well as a, as a starting place. It gives a framing for understanding what to do as an artist in this landscape. Albert always wanted it to be for people. That's why he didn't have any signs around or anything. He wanted it to be like this mysterious experience. It's a different experience for everybody. I mean, it's, you'll make it your own. I can't wait to make it my own. Thank you so much. Take care, bud. Okay. The word out here really with these sculptures is contrast because you see the blue sky and the colors of the desert and then these are stark white and they're very active but they're very still at the same time. It's very eerie, but it's very peaceful. I can see why Albert would want you to make the drive out here in the middle of nowhere to see these for yourself. With its lush pastoral orchards, this scene resembles a picture postcard from a New England countryside. Can you believe this is Nevada? Bill. Hey, John. Welcome to Red's Ranch. <laughs> it's good to be here. Nice to see you, sir. Any difficulty finding the place? Not at all. This is some of the most beautiful country I've seen in a long time. Spectacular spot. Some of northeastern Nevada's prettiest. Well, I know you got a lot to tell me. I got a lot to learn. Let's take a look around. This is Bill Watson, the general manager here at Red's Ranch. What? A setting, it's like like paradise. So let's start with the town. What can you tell me about the history of the town? 
The first Anglo settlement was in 1865 when John Walker and Colonel Thomas Waterman came here from the mining town of Austin and settled this lush valley. This was their headquarters ranch. Waterman is said to have named the town of Lamoille and the Lamoille Valley after his hometown of Lamoille, Vermont because of the similarity to New England. Eventually, they moved a mile south to the current town of Lamoille. Lamoille is located 20 miles south of Elko in northeastern Nevada. This ranch had a long and storied agricultural history. Keep in mind, Elko County was a leading beef producer. The ranch served as an agricultural hub well into the 80s. And it's not just beef, because there's orchards here as well, right? That's correct. These meadows were irrigated by the streams and ditches and produced beautiful, lush fruit orchards. Now, where does this water come from? Who, who... Well, the source of the water is snowmelt in the Ruby Mountains. It looks absolutely pristine. It is crystal clear, and it's very cold. This stream is actually man-made. Walker and Waterman hired former railroad workers to dig up ditches for irrigation. Now tell me real quick about Ruby Mountains, because they're right over there and they're spectacular. Well, the Ruby Mountains are one of America's most stunning mountain ranges. Yeah. Sometimes the Ruby Mountains are referred to as America's Alps or Nevada's Yosemite. The Ruby Mountains were formed by glaciers, and therefore they're very craggy and alpine-like. Just stunning escarpments and plateaus up there. It's where the Shoshone Indians would gather pine nuts, and this was their home long before our Anglo history. Okay, so how did the Ruby Mountains get their name? It is said that the Ruby Mountains got their name by early settlers discovering stones that looked like rubies. These stones glistened. They turned out to be other semi-precious stones. However, the name stuck. Those early settlers started venturing out here more than 150 years ago. At some point, I know the ranch fell into, well, it, it wasn't gonna be what it is today. There was a period of time when the property was being sold and considered for development. A group of us formed a land trust to save this property in perpetuity. We acquired the ranch and began restoring the historic buildings. So listen, you've obviously put a lot of work into this. Why do you think it's so important to preserve Nevada history to this extent? I'm from New England. New England's Anglo history is much longer. The town I'm from was settled in 1655. Nevada's history, like so much of the American West, is shallower is so far as time, but very, very rich. Red's Ranch is representative of an intersection of history. Here is told the story of mining, timbering, logging, pioneering, emigration, agriculture. So much of that history crosses right here. This intersection of history is destined to remain intact. You know so much and you've done so much about it. Is it fair to say that you're a curator of Nevada history? It's fair to say I love preserving Nevada's heritage. Thank you so much for taking the time today. John, thank you for joining us here at Red's Ranch. Absolutely. You know, preserving Nevada history doesn't just happen. It takes passionate people like Bill. And of course, being in the setting of Red's Ranch doesn't hurt either. Revving engines, loyal fans, and clouds of dust. This is the Mint 400. It's known as the Great American Off-Road Race, and it takes place just outside of Las Vegas. All right, so we just arrived at the Mint 400. You can see the dust and you can hear the noise from a mile away down on the highway. Now the first race is just finishing up and everybody's starting to gear it up for that all important second race that's gonna be happening in just a little while. Let's go take a closer look. The Mint 400 began in the late 1960s as a desert off-road ride between Las Vegas and Reno. It was initially a promotional ride to hype deer hunting season for the Mint Hotel. But over the years, big name race drivers and sponsorships helped make this off-road desert race one of the most recognized and spectacular in North America. The race disappeared for a few decades. In 2008, it came roaring back, and today the Mint 400 is bigger and better than ever.
Day before the race, we're high above Fremont Street where all the trucks are coming in. They're getting registered. They're getting their safety checks. All the fans are coming out. The energy is really starting to build for tomorrow's race. You can feel it. I'm going to go down and take a closer look. It's registration day, and we came here to meet the local favorite. We're in the midst of 40,000 people descending on Fremont Street in Las Vegas for the Mint 400, but there's one man that stands apart from them all, Rob Mack. Native to Las Vegas, the off-road veteran driver Rob McCachran races in the unlimited trucks and buggies category. What do you think makes you so good? How do, how do you do it? Well, uh, you know, I raced motorcycles when I was a kid, and uh, you know that that gave me the knack for reading the desert. Um, and then on top of that, you know, I've I've been doing this since 1982, so I've got a lot of experience out there in the desert. And uh, one thing that I'm thankful for is when I did start, my father made me work on the car. You know, and at the time before we got the car, I'm like, I'm in, I'll work, you know, but once I started doing it, I hated it. But he said, you don't work on the car, you don't race. So I think that gives me the respect for the vehicle and the knowledge to know, you know, how hard, it, you know, how hard I can put it through things and uh, in, end up keeping it together. Now on a personal note, just coming through here, 40,000 people, a lot of people want, want to talk to you. Do you feel that pressure and how do you handle all that? Well, it's good. You know, it's what I do. You know, I've made off-road racing, you know, my career. You know, I like to say it's my hobby. It's my it's my job. It's my getaway. It's all that for me. So, you know, I, I know that I need to come down here and, uh, you know, and speak with the fans. We'll be out there rooting for you. Thank Thanks, you. Rob. Appreciate good that. Luck. The second race of the day is about to start. Right at the gate, we meet Jim Graham, the director of communications for the event. Oh, the, the second race is the one everybody comes for. It's the unlimited trucks. You're looking at million dollar vehicles, 900 horsepower. I've been in a race car when these things have come past us. They sound like a force of nature, so people are gonna love it. Do you have a prediction? I have no prediction, and it's anybody's guess. I'm gonna make one right now. Rob Ackman, I think, is gonna win this thing. That's, that's what we're thinking. I'll go with that, he's a local favorite. I know you're busy. Thank you so much, Jim. Appreciate it. Competitors line up two at a time. There is a low rumble that is going across the desert floor right now. It's about 130 cars that are just waiting to start the second race of the day. That's their starting point. The energy is building. You can feel it. This will be a four hour journey that we're about to see. When that green flag drops, the adrenaline starts. Each set of competitors takes off only 30 seconds apart. Wondered what it's like to be right at the starting gate of the mid 400. This is it. It's hot, it's dusty, it's loud, and it's very exciting. For these drivers, this is the start of a long haul through the Nevada desert, where they'll hit speeds nearing 140 miles per hour. Each truck will compete in three 126 mile laps. The mid 400 is a race about endurance, stamina, unpredictable terrain and speed. We're heading up the highway. We're going up to another vantage point to meet some fans and see what's going on up there. There is no shortage of fans at this stop south of Prim. The crowd seems just as large and loud as the one at the starting gate. The Mint 400 is the biggest off-road race in America. I mean, take a look at this. If you look down this way, it's people as far as you can see, and it goes that way as well. Now, we've got parents here, we've got grandparents, we've got kids, people are grilling, having a great time. And where are you from? Las Vegas, Nevada. Okay, what's the best part about being out here? Uh, the dust, definitely, because you can't <laughs> see within 20 feet. And then I like the uh, noise. It's really cool seeing them go by really fast. Do you have a favorite racer? Rob McCaffrey. And Rob Mack is doing well, but no matter how skilled the driver or how tricked out the truck, on a track in the middle of the Mojave Desert, anything can happen. The sun is going down, adding an extra layer of difficulty. Nighttime. As you can see, it's getting very late out here in the race. As a matter of fact, most of the drivers are on their third and final lap. Behind me, this is Rob Mack's pit crew. And Rob has been through three times, and until just seconds ago, they were uncharacteristically glum, feeling that Rob had just blown his transmission way out in the middle of the desert at mile number 41. However, it appears that things have just changed, and now they're thinking it's something else, and he's still in the race. So we'll have to wait and see, but it's just moments away from a conclusion here at the mid 400. It's time to go back to the start line and find out the final results. Today, we've been to Spectator Points, we've been to the pit crews, we've talked to all the fans. It's just about to end, but really nobody knows how. Well, it had to be a clean run or you wouldn't be here like you are. 
Uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, under the circumstances, it's a cleaner run than a lot of people had, but this truck is fast. Justin Lofton takes first place. Rob Mack comes in third. A respectable finish for this fan favorite. Emotionally, how do you feel right now? Oh, I, I'm, you know, I'm disappointed. You know, I, I'm all about winning. You know, I want to win these races. We never won, you know, I've never won this race overall. We, we finish, it's tough, it's disappointing that we got to wait 365 days to try to get uh, the Mint 400 checked off our bucket list. You bring that up. For the fans out there, what do you want to say about 2016 in the mid 400. We can't wait. You know, we got 365 days and we'll be back here and we definitely want to put this uh, rock star truck on the top spot. Uh, you're a great ambassador for the sport. Thanks a lot. Thank Good you. luck to you. Appreciate See it. See you up the road. What we've learned here today, the mid 400 is really about a lot of fun. And if that's the case, well then we're all winners today on Outdoor Nevada.